That Triathlon Show 196. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, I interview Melanie McQuaid. Melanie is an elite triathlete. She's a five-time world champion across uh, Xterra and ITU cross triathlon races. And as you'll hear in the interview, she's a very knowledgeable coach and uh, so she really is the perfect guest to talk about the ins and outs of uh, training for and racing Xterra and other off-road triathlon races, which we'll cover today. Before we get into the interview, big thanks to Precision Hydration for sponsoring this episode. As uh, you'll hear, we talk a lot about uh, Xterra races like uh, the World Championships on Hawaii, on Maui. And that is, of course, a very humid climate, which we touch upon. And in hot and humid climates... The importance of replacing electrolytes increases, so uh, that is uh, what Precision Hydration can help you with. And they have a free online sweat test on precisionhydration.com that uh, will give you a ballpark estimate for your sweat rate and your sweat sodium content, which can help inform your race hydration strategy. And uh, this is, we're approaching the end of August, so final call for the promo code that triathlon show 20 which will take 20% off your entire order on precisionhydration.com. If you want to just try one box or tube, then you can do so for free with the promo code that's triathlon show, all on word, all caps. But again, if you want to make a bigger order and get a discount, make sure to do that now because the code that triathlon show 20 expires at the end of August. Also, big thanks to Roka for sponsoring the episode. Roka are running their Details Matter campaign, and here is another input that I got, and this one is from Jess in Operations, who writes about the details of the Viper swim skin. Uh, Jess says, I love the Teflon coating on the swim skin. Water literally just rolls off of it and makes me super hydrodynamic in the water, which means that I go faster. I also love the Autolock zip on the Viper Pro and the Viper X. All I need to do is flip the zipper up and pull from my shoulders, and I'm on my way to the fastest transition ever. Go and check out Roka and all their different lines of products, including swim skins, wetsuits, dry suits, and high performance eyewear on roka.com. That's R O K A.com. And use the promo code TTS, all caps, to get 20% off your entire order. All right, this interview with uh, Melanie is uh, pretty long uh, because we had a lot to talk about and uh, you can tell that I enjoyed the conversation. I just want to say, by the way, that uh, even if you don't race Xterra and you don't plan to race Xterra, uh, I'm one of those. I don't plan to do that in the near future anyway. You can still get a lot out of this interview because many of the things that we talk about are generally applicable for triathlon training. So don't skip past this episode, even if Xterra is not your thing. Uh, stay with us and you will enjoy this interview, I'm sure. Without any further ado, here's Melanie McQuaid. Hey, post-editing note here just before the interview. Uh, it turns out we had some connection slash audio issues. So there are uh, points in the interview where you can't quite uh, hear all the words, unfortunately. Uh, but uh, I think that you should be able to, to get all of the context still and uh, the main meaning at all points. But apologies for these issues. Hope you get a lot out of the interview anyway. Welcome to That Triathlon Show. Melanie, how are you? I'm great. Thank you very much. So tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and uh, your background. Who, who are you for those that don't know you? <laughs> um, I'm a professional triathlete and coach, mostly coach now, um, based in Victoria, British Columbia. Uh, that's in Canada. Um, and I, I started um, as a World Cup mountain bike racer way back in, in the way back days. And um, I raced on the World Cup for about seven years. Um, and then I briefly switched to road racing. Um, I, I raced with, the, with a, a variety of teams that would pick me up for a, a season. Um, and then I also went to the, the UCI Road World Championships. And um, it's a kind of a funny story because that whole foray into road was what um, pushed me into Xterra racing. So 
Um, I went to Road Worlds. There's like a huge crash in the first 800 meters of the race. Um, I was pretty disillusioned with the idea of being a road cyclist where that kind of happens. And um, and then I went straight from that race um, to the Xterra World Championships that were were in Maui. And, it, and I hadn't actually trained for Maui, other than obviously cycling. I was was, was cycling. completely on a whim? Did you just, after that race, did you think that you want to try something new? Or no, to, had you been thinking be... about it before? <laughs> no, actually, look, the race director for Xterra, um, Dave Nicholas, he also directed a variety of um, mountain bike races. So I had gone and raced with the with the same crew that runs the race in Hawaii um, at like the Hawaii Mountain Tour, which was this crazy race, like um, in on Oahu. And then I also had raced the World Cup Finals when they were in Oahu. Um, so, so the Canadian team actually had some like the he just really liked the Canadians. I guess we're fun. And so he was constantly like recruiting us to come to this, um, to this world championships and and a variety of racers that were on the national team with me had already gone for like a couple of years and we're doing quite well because obviously they're really strong cyclists and the Maui course um, at that time for sure favored a a good cyclist. And so um, I just had friends that were going. And so I just thought, why wouldn't I try? Like I swam in high school, I'll get through the swim. And then, you know, whatever, I'm going to be in Hawaii and it's all good no matter what. So that, that was sort of my attitude towards the first one. And to be fair, I actually like did a little bit of like rec- reconnaissance work where I went to the Xterra that was in Whistler that year and um, I raced there. So I had like, I, I, I didn't have a wetsuit. So I swam in a freezing cold lake with no wetsuit and nearly passed out like from hypothermia. And then I got on my bike and was really fast. And then I got passed by like five people on the run predictably because i had how, how was you how was you running given that you didn't have any it running was not good on. it was not good like <laughs> i i just because i didn't run you know they actually the whistler run was probably the closest thing that i could do well at because it was straight uphill i mean if you don't run you want the run to be straight uphill because then it's more like cycling yeah. um but i was not fast i couldn't get down the hill <laughs> so that was the problem there's no leg speed for that um but I mean, that was basically the same fitness that I took to Hawaii because I went from that race in um, Whistler. I did another mountain bike race there, and then I went to Road Worlds in France, and then I flew back from France and went straight to Hawaii and um, didn't do a lot in the middle. and um, And I was second at that race in Hawaii, so it was and it was sort of like an epiphany for me. Like I I I didn't feel that passionate about road cycling. I needed a change from mountain biking because I was really disappointed that I didn't make the Olympic team. And I just wasn't sure if I was going to like commit to another four years of racing to then not make the Olympic team again. Um, and so I was really at a, a crossroads, like, do I quit racing? Do I commit to another four years of mountain biking? Or do I try this new sport? And and I, the decision was pretty much made that I was going to give it a go in triathlon, see if I could run. And um, and then I, I guess it took me – it took me three it took me three years to, to win my first race. And then, um, thankfully like that was a very good decision. And extra, my extra career was, was really good. So what year did you do those first re- races? And, uh, and since then, if you just, uh, shortly list your career highlights you had. Um, okay. So, so 2000 was the year I went to UCI road worlds. Um, and so that was also the year that I raced my first Xterra world championships. And I was second at that race. Um, in 2001, um, I switched to the, and I, and I raced the series. So, um, I won the worlds for the first time in 2003. I won again in 2005 and 2006. Um, I won the first ITU world championships in 2011 and then I won a second I2 Worlds in 2017, which was after my retirement from Xterra, which was, I switched to Ironman. <laughs> but, um, and then during that time, I won, like, I, w- I went undefeated. I never lost a race in Canada. Um, I had seven national titles in Canada. I won the U.S. Pro Series five times. I think I won 50 races. I won the European Championships. Um, I won the U.S. National Championships. Uh, yeah, so I like, for, and I think I was on the podium. I, I think I was first or second from 2004 to 2007, I think, like at every race I did, something like that. It was, I basically was always on the podium for a long Incredible. time. Incredible. So, yeah, that, that's, yeah uh... it was really good. Yeah, Xterra, like I, I really 
when I switched to Xterra, um, I had to reinvent myself as an athlete because it was a new sport, but I also had to reinvent like, how do I train? And, and, and I think that it was really a good thing for me to take a step back and, and have to learn something new from scratch. Um, and it's been, it's been sort of like a, a case study of N equals one in terms of like my analysis of, of how to train for the sport, how I respond to training for that sport. Um, and, 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 and it continued, you know, like I, I have, um, I have training logs that date back to like 1995. So I can see everything that I've done for years in my career and, and see, um, how, how things have changed, um, how things have gotten better, worse. And, 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 and it was just, I, I don't know. I, I think that sport itself, like was, I, I'm just really fortunate to have had, um, such a successful career in that sport. Like it, it's, it's been awesome. Like I still love it, but it's also like, um, it, it was, it, it was one of those things where I, I got to the point where it was time to take on a new challenge and see what other things I could be good at. And, and so sort of that's, that's kind of why in 2012, I went to, went to Ironman. It was not only that I want to be um, extra versatile, like I wanted to be good at any kind of triathlon, um, but also because I'm a coach, I just thought that there's like, there's, there's this whole frontier of long distance racing that I need to to learn as much as I can, as quickly as I can. And, and you know, there, not every professional athlete is going to be a good coach. I, I totally recognize that. Like some really are not teachers and really I think coaching is like teaching. Um, but if you have the opportunity to be a professional athlete and learn from inside the sport, I think it's a kind of a, a special perspective that um, will serve you well when, when you do turn around and, and try to teach things it's just a different perspective that I think um coaches that don't race don't have and that doesn't mean one is better or worse I think that lots of coaches that um are like you know like Brett Sutton who didn't race but have just been an absolute study of like athletes their whole life um it's just different and so that's kind of why I, I, I have gone and um I, I switched to Ironman in 2012 I won six half races I was second in my first Ironman and then I got injured and so um so now I'm still like, I'm still in the Ironman scene, uh, trying to see what's left for me to do. But mostly I, um, I have a big squad now, so I do lots of coaching. <laughs> so that that's me. That's me at this stage. Yeah, and and, and I, th I think I, I think an interesting note is that when you won that second ITU uh, cross tri triathlon world championships in 2017, you were 44, yes. if I remember yes. correctly. Yep. That's very impressive as well to to the longevity that you've had in the in the sport. And when when did you get into coaching? How how long well, ago? Well, I started that? coaching mostly off road triathlon athletes in two thousand six. So the Melrad Racing Team is is probably the first age group team that ever happened because it was like it was big in two thousand eight and nine. Um, and in, in that time, I coached a lot of the athletes that were in that team. And so, but that was mostly me sharing what I know about training for Xterra. So. I, I think everybody I coached was racing off-road triathlon. And then I started mm -hmm. coaching more of a, a, a variety of athletes. And so, like, I started coaching people who race mountain bikes, who race Grand Fondos. Um, and then and then I started moving more into athletes that wanted to race Ironman as well. And and so, yeah, so I think I think I my my coaching program kind of paused for a while like where I had like one or two athletes for a couple of years and then um about four years ago I started taking on athletes um in the new version of Mel Red Racing which is much more like a coaching program versus like like in 2008 and 9 it was more an extension of um you know kind of it was this it was like an extra promotion of, of sponsors I had because we sponsored like everybody on the team it was pretty awesome team, actually um yeah, and, and now it's more like I've created a team of athletes that can work together and, and are all training under my program. So I'd say the, the new version of the team is kind of more like three years old, maybe three or four. I can't remember. Maybe three to four. So let's discuss the training for Xterra because we already have a lot of episodes on the podcast mm -hmm. about uh, about on-road triathlon. So so let's focus on, on the Xterra yeah. off-road <laughs> stuff here. If we start with the demands of that type of racing and, and how they differ from standard triathlons, we know that you're you're going to need to to ride a mountain bike and, and run on trails, but 
what does that mean really in terms of the demands that you need to train for uh, both technically and physiologically and anything else that uh, that comes into play yeah so um i th i think if you if you take extra the closest race distance that would would sort of be similar would be like an olympic or standard distance triathlon so like you know it's supposed to be 15k 40k 10k so it's in extra it's rarely that far right like the the race directors are are directed to sort of make the bike take x amount of time so i think they want it to take somewhere between an hour 15 and two hours on the bike and then they want it to be um about 10k of running and i think there's extra extra lenience in terms of like how long that run is so the one thing you can expect with an extra is that it's probably going to be a two lap course that's about 1500 meters again it's never like it's it's very rarely like exact in this sport so um it's not a sport for people who like to look at their splits <laughs> so um <laughs> because it's it, it, the terrain basically dictates what the race is so it's very hard to like sort of wrap your head so every single race is a, a brand new challenge that's that's the way i would describe what an extra race is like um and then again according to the train i i've been to races that are pancake flat like riding through the sand and then i've been to races that are point to point where all you do is ride uphill all day so it, from one race to the other it just depends on the venue that you're going to what exactly you're going to encounter in terms of um what the fitness you need for that race is um, a significant, a significant amount of the X Terra tour, um, when I was racing at full time was altitude there, because we did a lot of venues at American ski resorts. So there was a lot of altitude races, um, on the, on the program, um, in the, like, you know, er, early to mid to, well, I guess like be up to 2010, we had a lot of races that were altitude and still like the U S championships and Beaver Creek are, are pretty high altitude races. Um, and then. Uh, so altitude is a factor in North America. It's not so much in Europe. Um, and I've only raced a smattering of races in Europe. So I, I can't comment too much on the European tour. I, I know some of them, but not all of them. Um, and then the run, the run, it, it, it's meant to be a trail run, but it doesn't mean that there's not going to be road sections. Like, again, it comes down to the train where, where they might connect um, stairs and sidewalks and, and paved bits with um, little bits of trails, like you could be running through water. Um, I mean, we ran through a big section of water at the ITU Worlds in 2017. Um, it's it's basically get from point A to point B, and it's going to be around 10k. And that 10k is going to take you forever. It's going to be the longest 10k because it's there's no there's no flat straight bits generally. That's that's very infrequent. So so I think that the that Xterra and off-road triathlon requires versatility and adaptability, right? So if, if that's what you can expect, unless you're planning to only race one specific race, you want to come into the season with the biggest bag of tricks that you could possibly have so that whenever you come to a race, you're, you're ready for whatever that is. So you need to be strong. You need to be able to climb. You need to be able to descend. You need to be able to corner. You need to be able to... Um, get a rhythm in terrain running that does not allow you to have a rhythm. Um, you need to be able to run uphill. You need to be able to run downhill. Um, you need to be able to swim in a wetsuit without a wetsuit in waves, in a river, in a lake. You need to be able to run on the sand. You need to be able to enter and exit the water quickly. Um, so there's just a variety of things that, um, are key for this type of racing that you may not have to think about as much if you're so like if you're going to an olympic distance triathlon maybe your entry and ex exit might be important if it's a challenging one like if it's a surf start and finish but if it's in a lake and you're just going to run in and then run out to transition maybe those few seconds that you lose aren't going to matter when you get on your bike but an extra you have to do it twice right so if you mess it up twice now you've got lost double the time um in that situation and then you're going to go get on your bike. I would say that the transitions in Xterra are, are not overly um, challenging. Like you just basically, you can run in a mountain bike shoe. So I don't spend a lot of time worrying about people's transitions in Xterra. Um, but, but you, as soon as you get on the bike, that's what, probably the most amount of time that you're going to spend in an Xterra is going to be on your bike. So it starts to skew towards long distance racing in terms of how much the, your bike split is going to affect your race and how much your biking ability is going to affect your run. 
an Olympic distance race, you can, well, it depends on what kind of race, but I think that you could probably sort of soft pedal and run really fast. Um, once you get towards 90 K of riding, like you're going to lose so much time to start with, and then you're still going to be tired if you're not fit after you've ridden 90 K. So right around that point is where I think, um, Xterra sort of mirrors what's happening in, in half distance racing because the bike is so important. Um, and, and I always like skew my discussion towards athletes that are really trying to perform well, but even for somebody that is trying to finish, um, I, I think that the, the amount of fitness you need for, for riding is, is much more important than, um, than like a huge amount of run volume because the, the run isn't super long. Um, and it is massively affected by your, by your bike. So, um, that's where I think it sort of moves more towards like an, a long distance race versus like a, the standard. Does that make sense? Is that, that is that what lot, you're, yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. So a follow up to that in terms of the, both the bike and the run, I guess, with the terrain and with the, uh, the, the elevation that you have and the, the constant change in terrain, would you do the training? Would it be different? Do you need more sort of upper end power? That, do you practice that more for Xterra than you would for, for a half distance or full distance and potentially even for non-draft Olympic racing? What's your, your take on that sort of, you mentioned versatility there, and, and that's something that I imagine would be a big part of, of being a good Xterra athlete. Yeah, yeah. So so I think in terms, for Xterra, the biggest thing is like riding your mountain bike um, requires a lot of torque. Like, and, and so you need to be really strong because a lot of people run into back problems from, um, like from that torque of riding their, like having to, you know, grind it out, which is a big part of, of riding a mountain bike all the time. So, so in terms of like having strength, um, like you need to have strength, like you would need for a half. So that kind of training where a lot of overgear work is super beneficial, a lot of sort of steady state mid aerobic that that's where i would start to like say no um xterra training needs to be a lot more polarized than what a half distance racer would do so so because you, you need to be able to go really really hard for a very short period of time usually to when you encounter an obstacle or in order to ride efficiently on a mountain bike which is very much like way over and, and kind of way under um but at the same time, like the, mountain biking is, is aerobic, right? It's a big aerobic effort with a lot of anaerobic sort of punches. So I think the mistake some people can make when they're training for mountain biking is they can do too much intensity and it's not really hard enough. Um, and they don't do enough sort of aerobic base. What can you can you clarify that? What do you mean by it, too much intensity, but not hard enough? So a yeah, lot I don't of like sort of that, sweet really. cuts and uh, um, threshold I, type I work. Think you that mean that kind of work is sort of a bit of a waste for for this sport. I think you just yeah. need to ride okay. more in like zone two and just get a, a, like a big engine, um, because ultimately yeah. that the time that you're spending in zone two is what allows you to recover from going hard. So a lot of people think they need to go hard to be able to recover from going hard, but really it's your base. It's like, it's just the, your mitochondria, it's your fitness that, so you can go harder. So then, so what I'm advocating is you do a small amount of like extremely hard work that, that you need to be really fresh to do and you just let it marinate. And so that when you create a range that is massive, because you have this big base, and then you also have the ability to reach these really high numbers, then all of a sudden, that person who's training in zone three, who can't do anything in zone six, is going to get destroyed by you, because zone three for you is not hard, right? It's not something that's, you, it's, it, it, you can access that middle range if you have the whole range. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So, I, like, I advocate for mountain biking, like little bits of super hard training. Yeah, and those and then those, those super hard lots of th those super hard efforts would they be anaerobic or are we talking still yes. aerobic VO two max anaerobic? Anaerobic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Just it's it's more like you can't really get strong in the gym if you do like twenty reps of something. You're basically just training what you can already do. It's not yeah. going to make any difference to your strength. But if you do three reps of something really heavy, you're going to get strong. 
So and what's so, a, what's, a, what's a bread and butter anaerobic bike workout that you would prescribe? Like something like, I don't know, two sets of like 20 seconds really hard, four seconds just kind of cruising, but you're always going uphill. So like 20, 40s, something like that, like not because you're going to run out of gas for that like quick. So like two sets and then go ride for four hours. Mm -hmm. Like just at the beginning of a super long ride, do something really hard. And then, so, yeah. so that would be yeah. a, like something that would make a difference to your ability mountain biking. And then, um, and then I do like, I do break the rule because I have a session that is like that I, I, like I did throughout my entire career and I always give to everybody called the hour of power. And so in that workout, I send athletes out onto a loop course that takes somewhere between, I don't know, like the climb should be maybe five to eight minutes and it doesn't have to be technical. Like in fact, it's better if it's not that technical, but it still has to be off road. And then you have a descent that takes you four to five minutes and it should be technical within what you can ride. Like you never want to have to get off. Um, but something that sort of ideally it matches kind of the race that you're coming up against. So you can practice something that you need. And so in, we would have this loop and then they just do the loops according to how the workout is. So it's not like simulating race, um, but it gives athletes a time to do maybe intervals that are between five and eight minutes. So it's like a threshold uphill straight into a, a descent that they have to do while their heart rate is at max. Um, and they get to do it multiple times so they can work on their skills at race pace. And that is, I think, something that a lot of people don't do going into like in mountain biking is that they, they just ride their mountain bikes for fun. And so they just noodle along at like a pace that isn't what they want to race at. And then they're surprised yeah, to see how fast you have to ride your mountain bike in a race <laughs> when everybody's passing them. So, so I, I think there is a certain amount of that work that sort of supports the rest of it. Um, and that could be substituted with just racing. Yeah. So that that makes a lot of sense with that session to to really practice the the technical skills when when you are when you're really at the at the limit the way that you would be in a race. Uh, so speaking about the technical mm -hmm. nature, how often do you like your athletes to to ride outdoors? Indoor training is so big these days, so I'm sure that a lot of your athletes do a lot of training indoors as well as a trainer. But uh, what would be uh, maybe the ideal and then if you if you don't have a lot of time what would be like the more the normal case like or the minimum minimum amount of outdoor training that you need to do on your mountain bike to to be ready to be technically prepared for your race mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think the i i it's i think even the workouts that i'm describing are 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 not as are not as good done indoors so there i think the winter time when you're doing sort of like a general um, build into the season where it doesn't like, it doesn't matter as much how specific your training is because you're, you're just building an engine, right? At that time when it's rainy and crappy out, then yeah, it makes sense to ride your trainer a lot. And, and certainly like these types of intervals that I'm talking about are more when we get into a specific phase where you're like, cause if you're asking me what to do for X Terra, I'm talking about like in the last five weeks or six weeks where you're like it's peak season where it's time to be specific about what you're going to do. If you back that back it away from the race and you like spread the lens out, I'm, I, I already described how you want to have like the biggest bag of tricks possible. So when you're further away from the race, yeah, then maybe like workouts on the trainer um, make more sense. But what I have seen, and this is just like a reflection of like how many years I've been in the sport. Um, this the onset of Zwift has created like an entire army of just terrible bike handlers, terrible. And they so um, I do coach, and I I've worked with a lot of athletes that race Ironman, and it's just astonishing how um, little control of their bike they have because they don't have to do anything. I mean, if you break down mountain biking into like it's, there's like six main skills that go into mountain biking, nearly all of them are not addressed when you ride a trainer, right? Like, so number one is braking. So how to use your brakes, okay? You never brake when you're on a trainer. Operation of controls, you know, what gear am I gonna be in when I'm riding? You don't change gears when you're on a smart trainer. Position and balance, you know, you're, you're not gonna fall off. So even if you're sitting on your bike and your position is terrible, you can sort of like just fake it because you're 
you're you're not going to fall over, right? Timing and coordination. Well, you're never coming into a corner, so you never know and need to know when to like apply your brakes. So you're going to get none of that. Um, terrain awareness. I, Zwift, Zwift <laughs> does a lot to create like terrain in front of you, but you don't need to be aware of anything because you're not going to do anything. And then direction control, angulation, right? You never like just watching people with their arms locked out straight in front of themselves, their body like like not anywhere near staying like in the in the middle of the bike to try and navigate a corner. Like, it's not surprising that people are just crashing their bikes outside because they have no control over their bike because they have none of these six skills from riding the trainer. So if you're going to do Xterra, you need to have skills. And and these skills are are basic and they're acquired by riding a bike whether it's your road bike or your or your mountain bike you 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 have to practice this stuff like a lot and if you don't ride your bike outside a lot you will never acquire them because it's a uh, it's like swimming you know it, it, I, I i think that's the best way to equate it to another sport is that swimming requires frequency and feel and timing and all these things and and riding a bike is the same some people think that riding a bike is just a matter of having power and applying it to the pedals. Well, no, actually, it's not at all. And you'll find if you are really good on your trainer as a road biker and you try to like instantly move it onto your mountain bike, you might be really surprised at how terrible you feel and, and how that power doesn't transfer because your position is different and the terrain is is changing and um, it's just not the same. So... I would say like for sure, if you're in like the last six weeks, all of your intervals have to be on a mountain bike. Like you just, even me, like I, I, I went and did the, the Xterra in Victoria because it's local and I just thought I would show up, but I've been training for Ironman. I rode my time trial bike the whole week. I did like an hour pre-ride with the group just to get on my mountain bike for the first time in three months. And I got destroyed in the single track. It's my hometown race. No time information. No position and balance, no like terrain awareness because I'm looking too close in front of me. Like all of this stuff takes practice. Even if you have the skills, if you don't use them, they get rusty and they are not going to serve you well. So for sure, I think the trainer is just a bad idea for, I think it's a bad idea for, for, I mean, if you're a, a, a an athlete who has one workout a week that's just better executed on a trainer because you don't have hills or it's like something where you're going over and under and you don't have a straight, like in Victoria, I can't ride in, in TT position more than like five minutes without making a turn. So if I want to do 10 minute intervals, really, I got to do it on the trainer. But other than that, like I try to ride as hilly, twisty and whatever I can to, to develop some skills on a regular basis. Yeah, the, the, those are some excellent arguments. I, I was starting to think about uh, when I was uh, younger, I used to play a little bit of guitar, but I also played Guitar Hero on the PlayStation. But no matter how much I played Guitar Hero on the PlayStation, no matter how good I got, it never made me a better guitar mm-hmm. player mm-hmm. on the actual instrument. So it's a bit the same yeah. there. And if we talk about the run a little bit, some of the things here I'm sure apply similarly to running, maybe not as strongly as on the bike, but both the technical and the metabolic physiological aspects. Can you, can you discuss that a bit the same way that you discussed the, the bike training? For sure. So I think the, I, I think the main thing with the running is that the training for X Terra for running starts in the gym before the season ever starts, because um, the main thing that um, separates a really great X Terra runner from a, a good to great road runner is agility. And, and, somebody who's like a really outstanding runner on the road will probably have a lot of the the things that are required for Xterra, but may not. So um, you need to have really strong feet and ankles to be a good Xterra runner because you are going to be constantly landing on uneven terrain and you're going to have to be able to move quickly laterally and like up and down. And so that requires a lot of sort of lower limb agility and power and so then and this is again just to, to be fast right if you just want to get through an extra course obviously you, you you take all this stuff and you dilute it but i'm just going to talk about if you want to be a top level racer where to start and, and where to look for these these differences um that kind of agility and 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 power 
lends itself to really good leg speed, right? Because you have you can push more force into the ground, you come off quicker, your ground contact time is quite shorter. Ground contact time is a massive factor in running fast downhill. Because if you're landing hard and staying on the ground longer, there's more chance for you to like roll an ankle, take a bad step, fall. So I think the number one thing that any Xterra athlete should be doing in the off season is working on their feet and ankles and their um, like their lateral strength and and power, like being able to hop on one leg and 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 how how good is their balance and their um, stability on on one or the other leg? Because very often that sort of instability um, shows itself when they they go to start running, and then you, you know then all the rest of the run training. If you don't have those elements, like if you don't have strong feet and ankles and lower legs, you're just never going to be a good runner. So, so basically, if you don't have these things to start with, um, then your ability to be consistent is going to be hampered and you're probably going to get injured down the line. So really, it comes down to that regardless. I, I like sometimes it's people think it's their hips, but most of the time it's just something with their, their articulation with the ground has gone wrong. And so that just moves up the chain. So whether it's your knees or your hips or your lower back or whatever it is, most of the time it comes down to your feet and ankles. And what I see mostly is athletes don't have enough dorsiflexion in their feet. So they can't move like when they land, they can't like land and under their hips enough and they kind of end up in front. And so they kind of jar themselves and that either, you know, jams their hamstrings or their hips or whatever. So really that's, no matter what level of athlete or what um, discipline of triathlon they're they're in, I usually look at their feet and ankles first. I usually find a problem, and then once that problem is sort of addressed, they make progress. So, if you look at Xterra, it's like it's agility. If you can't if you can't hop on on one leg or the other, like you have to start there because running is essentially hopping from one leg to the other. And then running downhill in like gnarly woods and trails and slippery and whatever is um, landing on an unstable surface, hopping from one leg to the other. And, and when you just isolate it to just the basics, um, that even if you're fit, if you, can, <laughs> you can't like absorb the landings, it doesn't matter. So that's that's running for us. That's, that's where I yeah and, and as you as you mentioned those those things are important for for any running mm -hmm. discipline like mm -hmm. even if you're just running on flat roads mm -hmm. the the ground contact time is going to be much faster if you if you have strong feet and ankles and you're going to to have a, a much stronger push off so producing more power with each step uh, i have a, a resource that i really like which is on youtube uh, if uh, people search gwen jorgensen keep your feet strong and healthy that's a great mm -hmm. video video mm -hmm. of gwen jorgensen and the routine that she does so that's something that we can link to in the show notes. And, and do you have anything, any other, any routine that you, or any resources online that people can look at, or, or do you have your own well, program I, basically? Like I it? have a YouTube channel that I don't update very often, <laughs> um, but I did put in there. Um, another thing is, um, and this is not, we were getting really specific about um, running there, but like I, I did put a, a, a routine for core activation because that another when athletes come to me in the, like I usually do my camps in the winter and athletes come to me and, and we're going to work on basically all of this stuff, like the, the fundamentals. Um, I generally kind of do a little screen and I'm not a physiotherapist. So this isn't like a health screen from a, a physiotherapist. It's just a, do you have adequate range of motion to even access triathlon related movements? And I like, it's always shocking to me that some people just don't, right. They don't even have adequate range of motion to do triathlon and so sure like you can argue till you're blue in the face that stretching is is wrong for this and you need to have stiff ankles you need to this but if you don't have adequate motion or range of motion to even do these three things swim bike and run there's a problem so we start with that and we start with mobility and um and then we uh, for for all the swim workouts and 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 such i like people to start with um like just a basic core activation routine. And I have that on Melrad. It's if you go onto my website and Google or search for that, it'll come up. It's a YouTube video that I did. And it's basically just something to get your, um, 
just your hips and your core to sort of activate before you start doing things. And, and that would be one thing that I would leave people with is even for before you go for a run, before you go for your first swim of the day, before you go mountain biking, um, if you do these basic things, um, you're less likely to get injured and you're more likely to perform well because things are just sort of rolling. And if you're like 18 to 23 years old, most of that stuff is probably going to be working before you start. If you're 40 years old and you've been sitting at your desk all day and you haven't done any strength training in about 15 years and you're just coming back to triathlon and you've decided you want to be a mountain biker, you're about to go from sitting at your desk to sitting on your mountain bike very often in a, in a flexion position where your, your, your back is rounded. Um, and that's, it, and, and that position is really hard on your sacrum and all the muscles and stuff around there. So if that isn't strong to start with, so you're using the right muscles to, um, you know, push the pedals and you don't have all your stabilizers activated to keep things square while you're pedaling really hard on your mountain bike, you run into trouble. And, and that's probably the most common thing I see in mountain biking is lower back issues because, um, Athletes are coming to the sport. They don't really um, do a lot of strength work. They aren't really aligned correctly. They do do a lot of sitting at a desk. Um, they haven't done a lot of flexibility. And then they they end up like just blasting themselves on their bike and, and running into lower back problems. So, um, yeah, besides the feet and ankles, I would highly recommend the core activation routine because that that can just, it, it seems so dumb and so little, but it makes a huge difference. And I think it would help a lot. Of people. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And, and it's so good that you, you bring this up. And I think that for people, even if people are, have been training for years and years and think that, well, I've never had any injury issues, so, so I don't need to bother. But, but I think that the performance benefits that you get in the workouts from doing a short few minute sequence of uh, core activation and, uh, and mobilization before your, before your workouts, that that could potentially go a long way to taking you to the next level if you can if you can run 10 seconds or five, even five seconds per kilometer faster in your in your hard intervals or swim one or two seconds per 100 meter faster it's in in the long run that's going to make a a really significant difference so so i think i absolutely agree with with those points mm -hmm. and and like i'm i'm not a morning person so like when i go to swimming it's it's early for me and i'm just always just getting there and getting in the pool it takes me like a thousand meters to get going because i've just gotten out of bed and like because this program's early if i'm not there early enough to do like a mobilization it takes me forever to get going i would almost be better to be on the pool deck and do a bunch of mobility stuff specifically for my core and my thor thoracic spine than swimming like I really like that would be, and that would probably be like closer to what we actually do at a race, right? We do about 400 meters of like really intense warm up, and then we start. And and instead, like I just join the practice and I do like 1,200 meters of swimming like crap, and then maybe by the second round of the set, I'm actually warmed up. For me, it would be much better for me to just sit on the deck, do a bunch of do the core activation routine, do some thoracic spine mobilization. Um, do some deep breathing, whatever, and then get in the water, do the, the final bit of the warm up, And I'm, I'm sure I like, I perform better when I do that. And periodically I do do the, like a race warm up versus like a swimming warm up. And without exception, like the mobile, the mobility and the core work is better for me than the warm up. So that would be something that I'd leave people with when they're looking at programs and they're showing the pool and they're not feeling it. And like, maybe you don't need that thousand meters of fluff that is not making you any fitter and instead you need to work a little bit on this mobility and then get straight into the main set and um, use your time wisely so, or even start in your office at work doing the mobility <laughs> so then you can fit more another round of the main set in when you go to the pool. Yeah, you know what I do sometimes when I'm in the pool, and uh, I'm lucky that I have a pool where I can always get a, uh, a lane to myself, and there's rarely people in the locker room. So sometimes I do the mobilization in the locker room, and I listen mm -hmm. to some, some music to set me up for, if I have a hard set at least, uh, listen to some music that's going to motivate me while I'm going through the, the warm-up. And only then, so then I can still, because I have my phone there in the uh, in the locker room and I have my headphones and then I take them out when I'm done and, and go and start with my swim. So uh, it's uh, just a way to like 
I guess it's sort of like a ritual that's, that a lot of great athletes have their rituals that they always do before races or before training. And, and I found that for swimming, that one is, is one that really puts me in the right mindset to, to do a, a good, solid training set when, when I'm swimming. And the same sort of mm-hmm. thing for running, really. I, I do that uh, at home in my, in my office before I go out for, for running and can, can listen to, to music before, while I do that. So, so I think that has become a ritual that is uh, both physiologically but also psychologically very beneficial. Yep. Yeah, I think just taking that time to like, like push the other things that are in your head aside will allow you to focus better. And yeah, there's no question that focusing makes a big difference when, you, when you're performing at anything. Yeah. So if we go to the, the running, we continue with the running. So what about the, the structure of the actual workouts? You, because you mentioned there with the, with the cycling, a big focus on zone two and then workouts. What, what's the, uh, the lowdown on the, on the run training that you prescribe? Well, so running itself is, it's really hard on your nervous system to do a lot of running. So um, because the, the event is a little bit um, short-ish, I feel like it's better to kind of get your base of running in a little further out so that you don't, like you, you can work on one thing sort of at a time. Like most most athletes only, they, can, they can't really work on a 12-day schedule, right? They need to work within their seven-day work week. And within that seven days, like I'll, I, I don't, most of the people that I coach are mid to mid thirties and older. And so you can't do a workout every two days. You just can't, you're just not going to recover, especially like when you're doing the program that I'm advocating, which is really hard. And so you really only have like a smattering of intensity that you, you fit in the week. I feel like most of it belongs on the bike because you're going to, the bike is going to affect everything else you're doing. So really with running, we need to make sure that you have specific strength for running and we need to have like leg speed for running. So like running for Xterra, you know, you need to do like some, you need to do some trail runs where you're, you're getting some hill work, which introduces a little bit of strength and intensity without specifically trying to run really hard. Uh, you need to do some strides straight uphill that are quite short that are your main meat and potato strength work for running where you like anywhere from like 10 to 20 seconds on a steep hill where you're just booting it up the hill and the walking down um that pretty much that workout right there that's pretty much enough for you to be able to run well (laughs) um and then aside from that a little bit of work on an on rhythm and 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 timing and terrain awareness like all the same skills that you you need for mountain biking in terms of navigating trails you need to do a little bit of work on trails running to be able to be good at that right so probably fartlek training where you're you're trying to do a little bit of work um, at race pace on and off so you kind of get used to adapting to undulations like you get used to running an interval that's downhill um and and just getting used to what specifically you're going to be doing in a race. So, um, but it's a lot. The problem with this is everybody wants to be able to write down a workout, right? And go, Oh, I'm going to do this. And, and a, a lot of this training is just, just um, aerobic exposure to terrain, right? Where you're not like, I, I think what, what I see all the time is people come to me and they, they have, training programs are chock full of workouts because coaches just feel like they have to put something that's like intensity in there to make it feel like people are training and are doing something and that coach is doing their job. And really you have to like make a workout count and then you need to rest from it and then like wait until you're going to do another workout that counts. And sometimes in a seven day period, like some of the workouts look like they're not counting at all because a workout is only strides. Well, that strides workout is probably the best workout you could do in your entire program. And people are like disappointed that they're not doing like six by a mile or whatever. Um, so, so that's the thing, like with the run training, you want to be able to do enough run training that you acquire the skills and the fitness specific to the sport, but you want to make sure that it doesn't, because running is so neurologically taxing, you can only do a certain amount of it because it's going to cost you on your mountain bike. And the other thing is like when you're doing really hard mountain bike and you're doing those like hour power workouts or you're doing your aerobic workouts where you're riding like for quite a long time in your mountain bike, 
your upper, like your whole body gets really tired because there's a whole bunch of sort of stability and, and just mountain biking just costs you more than like three hours on a mountain bike, no matter how not technical it is, it's going to cost you more than on your road bike because you're constantly supporting your body more. And so that's going to cost you when you're swimming. It takes longer to recover. Most athletes will find that when they're mountain biking a lot, they swim like crap because their shoulders get tired. So all of this stuff is, is like holistic. So I think you get so much fitness just from doing all three sports that you need to worry less about having specific workouts for running that are the same workouts that you're doing for mountain biking and more just have like within the, the amount of time that you have available in the week. Just remember that most of what you need is aerobic training. Mostly it just needs to be easy. Um, and then when you're ready, you need to do a really hard hit of something that makes a difference. And then you kind of need to go moderate or easy until you're ready to go hard again. So sometimes run training just takes a complete backseat. It can just be strides. All you do is just run easy, waiting for whatever the next workout is. And then maybe once in a while you, you do a hard workout that's fart lick, but really you put a lot of your energy and time into making sure that your mountain biking is really strong. Because if you, if you come off the bike tired, which you will, and you don't have anything left, it doesn't matter how fit you are running because you're, you're just not going to have, it's just not going to be there because the bike costs you too much. That's a really good breakdown. I really like that uh, that methodology. And and I'm going to probably cut out part of this clip when you talk about the strides because uh, I also like to prescribe strides strides quite a lot. And uh, and when but when I have a, a workout in the program of my athletes and it, it's just an easy zone to run with some strides in the middle or or towards the end, uh, then uh, I do see quite often that uh, the strides seem to uh, athletes get strides blindness and, and just do the endurance run because mm-hmm. it doesn't seem like a workout to mm-hmm. just do four 15 second strides or something like that. But but they are, as you say, very important and and, and they are not very taxing. So really good uh, good value for the for the input that you that you put into it and the, the cost that you uh, that you incur uh, physiologically. Well, so the, it's a really great, great thoughts there. The, the, the thing is, is that those strides, yeah, they don't, they don't, they're not taxing in that you're going to have like a hangover of, of training related fatigue after, but if you don't do them well, it makes it, so, so it's like a, a 20 second stride uphill is 20 seconds of maximal run speed, which is also 20 seconds of your best con- ground contact time your best stride length, your best posture, and your and your best overall speed. So I would equate a stride to like your three rep max in the gym, right? It's something where your coordination is ideal, your form is ideal, and the strength benefit of that effort is ideal. And so most people just get away from the fact that like they forget that unless you're doing something like really like hard for your body, you're probably not making any difference, right? You're not like, and, 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 except for maybe building some mitochondria. So, so doing efforts that are not that hard because you're tired and you can't access the speed or something like that, or they, they just don't make as big a difference as efforts that are, are actually hard. And, I think as we get older and particularly athletes that like that sort of zone three, okay, I've been sweating for a while. So therefore I've done some work today. They forget that's not really making any difference. Zone three is basically like it's practicing what you're already capable of doing. It's what your current ability is. So you're just reinforcing current ability, which is like, which is like the ultimate way to create a diesel engine. And if there's ever a sport where you're going to suffer for a diesel engine, it's Xterra. Like you will not be able to get up and over anything if you don't have range. And so the the problem is, is that as we get older, we don't have that jam to really like go really hard as easily. Like, I, like if you look like at, at kids, their initial reaction is full gas. Right, they just like it's okay. Start full gas every time I go to an Iron Kids race. Like I can't keep up with the fastest kids because they go go off the line at like 
430 mile pace. Like they're just blasting it. And then they, of course they die in a hundred meters, but they went out that fast. And for me, you know, Iron Man, old lady, Iron Man lady can't do that at all, but I need to practice that pace because that's what keeps me from getting slower. And so really like as we get older, our main objective is to a create or at least maintain muscle mass. So strength, we need strength because it's just disappearing as we get older and create or at least maintain speed because that is disappearing fast too. And and you can't do any of like either of those things when you're tired or you've done a bunch of middling training. You just can't. So it's this, you have to like math, like massively polarized to be good at Xterra. And it, it, it flies in the face of the sweet spot training methodology and the, you know, I don't, I don't know, like most triathletes come to me and all they've been doing is zone three all the time. Like they get on their bike and they ride tempo for like somewhere between 20 and 40 minutes. That tempo is getting slower year over year. And they don't understand why they're training so hard, hard, they're so tired and they're so slow. And it's because like, easy is easy. It really is. Like, it's just not that hard. Like a group ride is way too hard for a three hour ride. It's way too hard. You're not getting, you're basically reinforcing your, your diesel pace the whole time because you're just, you're not going max really. You're kind of going middle max and then you're going super easy. And then, so yeah. So I feel like a lot, most like if you're, if you're looking at an elite athlete most of the time they're giving you like a key workout that they did that you know they probably have more time to train so maybe they get bigger workouts but the reason they're able to do this big workout is because they just do more volume than anybody else and even at the I think not a lot is coming out about what elite ITU athletes are doing but from my from what I gather from what Joel Filio is doing in Victoria it's a lot of volume and not really as much hard work as people think so it's not every day you're smashing yourself and and extra is no different in that it's going to take you longer to recover from riding your mountain bike and so you're going to actually be able to do even less than what an it athlete is doing which is less than you think and not as fast as you think except for this sort of like speed maintenance which is is not the kind of fast that people think is fast speed is speed it's really fast and really short all right. Th- thanks for clarifying that. That's, uh, that was really good. And uh, you should listen to, I interviewed uh, Joel Filial in episode 171, I think. That was a long, an hour and a half long episode. So he really mm-hmm. goes into detail on, on the training that they do. And well, he will confirm your suspicions <laughs> that oh, yeah. you're doing a lot of easy training and a lot of volume uh, and uh, just staying really consistent with it. Uh, yeah. but, uh, so a, a follow up on that, uh, the easy training that you prescribe, how do you prescribe it? Do you use heart rate, power, pace, and uh, how easy is easy for you when you coach? Well, I think easy is a, is a feeling. It's not a pace, right? Well, particularly for running, because if you think about it, when, when you're tired and your nervous system is, is fatigued, your, in, your interaction with the ground becomes you know, impaired. So when you're super tired, your ground contact time is going to go up, which means your pace is going to slow right down. So if you're tired, easy is a way different pace than when you're fresh and you're bouncing really well and you're coming off the ground quickly and, you know, you're rolling, right? So if you have bouncy legs, easy is a lot different than when you have heavy legs. So easy is always a feeling. It's it's never a pace. And, and I, I, I don't ever prescribe runs in that, like, like for my Ironman athletes, we have to work on a pace called what I, that I call easy fast, which is you have a heart rate cap and you can run as fast as you can under that heart rate cap. But what that's doing is creating some economy at a fat burning effort, right? And so what happens is over time that pace goes up, but the heart rate stays the same. And that's a specific Ironman thing. That's and and that that workout is excellent for XR athletes way out from the season, right? Where we build some sort of running economy. Um, but it's not specific to race season. So there's a lot of, there, there's, there's overlap in all the sports and sort of a general approach to training. But as you get more and more specific, then the training starts to look a lot different. So it's, it's hard to talk about workouts when you're not talking about what phase of your training you're in for these workouts. Um, but back to the point, which is um, easy as a feeling. On the bike, I, uh, it depends on the individual. Like some people are really accustomed to riding in zone three. 
So every time they throw a leg over a bike, they're out there riding in zone three. So for those people, I have to give them a cap, right? Like that, this, this pace, X number of watts, you are no longer in like in an aerobic. We're, you're not doing what we're trying to do. So you need to slow right down. You're not allowed to go over this, right? For other people, they ride too easy and I need to create some sort of deliberate effort or I just say you can ride as easy as you want. This is the hilly route you're going to do and you're just going to ride up and over some hills and then all of a sudden it's not all like riding around wasting time. Mountain bike training, you can't do any of this. It's Mountain bike training is pretty much zone two right from the start and then it's going to be a mix of things. So any kind of mountain bike ride is probably going to be an endurance effort of reasonable quality. And then if you ride with people that are faster than you, it's probably going to be like a race. <laughs> so, so mountain is kind of its own thing. Um, but back in the day before we had all these gadgets, you know, again, I've been around a long time. We had a heart rate monitor, which we rarely even looked at and a watch that gave us the time. And so, and the athletes that, that raced in that time, they, they, they're, just as good, if not better than any of the athletes that have like, like reams of objective data from lactate al- analyzers and power output and whatever. All, none of that stuff matters when it comes down to race day and you have to like ride within your limits. If you're looking at your watts, you're potentially like overdoing it or underdoing it, depending on what your body is giving you on the day. So I, I coach athletes to have all this data to send it to me so that I could have potentially been on a ride along. So I understand what was happening on that day, but they need to train and race based on their perceived effort, because that is the best measurement of, of what you're, you're capable of. So most of the time, like their program is pretty bare bones. Go, go run, do an easy run for 30 minutes and then do eight 80 meter strides and then come home. You know, easy is easy. And sometimes like I'll look in there and the easy was not easy, right? Like they're just blasting it. Their heart rate is like off the charts. And then at that point, it'd be like, well, come on now. Was that really easy? You know, so at least I have something to, to see like what was happening. But most of the time, the, the, the direction isn't that specific because it's not that complicated. Like easy really is easy. It's just, you know, as you get fitter, easy gets faster. That's and that's what's supposed to happen it's it's you know the you can get absolutely paralyzed by numbers and and like just that that I, that i think lends to this sort of like indoor training sort of philosophy where people want to be able to hit these numbers so if they go outside and they get to a, a traffic light then all of a sudden their watts go to zero and their average goes off and their average pace goes off and all this stuff and you know n- nobody gets to submit a training log at the start of a race to say, Hey, I'm more prepared than you. Therefore I win. Right. Your training log doesn't matter. It's like what you're actually capable of doing outside is what matters. And, um, and so like the best laid workouts with like the most absolute precision just don't matter. You know, it's more, you know, you need to have some flexibility. You need to have some freedom. It's supposed to be fun. Um, and, and you have to be able to sort of, tune in to what your body is saying on any given day because training is a you know it's an up and down thing and, and any given day easy becomes something entirely different and uh and you just have to roll with that i think that this episode is becoming a, a modern classic already because that segment there that was absolutely fantastic i i really really liked uh the, the things that you said there uh the easy is easy the one way that that i think that i do it at least in my coaching is to have a, a session RPE cap. So my athletes rate their session RPE after each session and, and an easy run or an easy ride, it should feel like a four or easier uh, on a scale from one, one to 10. So if it felt any harder, it was too hard, no matter if it was in zone one or zone two or zone three. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's one way to, uh, to check, to keep, keep that in check and make sure that you don't try to make up for having to stop for traffic lights or, or so on. Mm-hmm. And I think another a, a mistake that I want to bring up here is that I think a lot of athletes try to make their easy running pace or or cycling power make it uh, increase throughout the training period, and I think that's uh, like a very common problem because when you're getting closer to a race, most like your training is getting more challenging. You're going to be more fatigued. So uh, as you said, then when you are more fatigued, you're not going to have the same ground contact time and the same 
uh, same uh, stiffness in your in your tendons. So so you are going to run slower if you're going to run at the same effort level. So uh, so chasing faster easy speeds or or easy powers that's uh, that's the wrong way to go. And uh, and most often actually I think that the athletes that get it right they keep it the same or their pace or power goes down as they go for the easy run runs and rides as they go through the the training program but but in the the harder workouts they are progressing there and then what matters is the race day and not the training log as you say that, that was a brilliant way to end that discussion mm -hmm. with uh, yeah with, and with I, that I think that sentence. um it's natural for athletes to want to have sort of a, a a baseline check okay like how am i doing um and I think that, that it, that's what the, what stems from that is like, oh, can I hold a, like a faster pace now than I could in, in March or whatever? And so for athletes that need that sort of training log confirmation, it's better to just have, uh, you know, tests. So like I'll, I'll have an athlete, like in the winter, my athletes will run like an 8K off no fitness, right? Like, okay, what can we do with no training and no fitness? And then what can we do at a 5K later with fitness just to see what the progression is? And then later they'll have some workouts that are, that give them some sort of feedback. Okay, well, if you press the gas, this is what happens. So it, it, I think it's normal for athletes to be, to want to, draw confidence from the training i know that i certainly have in past in repeating workouts like been able to see some improvement in a workout and that just gives me confidence going into a race that's one thing if you need confidence from a performance but the there's no getting away from the fact that you like you have to keep everything on either end of the spectrum where it has to be quite easy when it's easy and and of all the sports, like running too hard is the one that costs you the most because, uh, it, like, as I was saying, you know, it's, um, it has the biggest neurological impact. Um, it has the most impact. And when you're tired and you're running too hard, your mechanics are probably flawed and that just exposes you to higher incidence of injury or just creating some sort of like niggle. Right. So it's, it's quite dangerous, actually, to to try and force your body to run harder than it wants to um, when you're supposed to be using whatever that run was for recovery or just frequency. So um, I think that I think that's you're right that people run into problems more with the running because running is costly. If you make mistakes when you're running, um, they tend to be de like hugely detrimental. Yeah. So moving on a little bit and uh, talking about racing, what are the important differences uh, racing Xterra compared to racing on-road triathlon and uh, that we should uh, think about? And what advice do you have for, for people that, uh, that are racing and trying to perform in Xterra? Um, so, well, yeah, you need a mountain bike. Right. So, okay. um, are we talking about equipment? Like, what are we talking about? Here? Well, let's let's talk about first things like pacing, uh, nutrition and hydration, uh, that sort of okay. race tactics, th those sorts of things. Okay. Um, okay. So, I, I'd say that like the swim in an extra is the same as the swim in an Olympic distance. Like, essentially, your first four hundred meters is going to set you up for the feet that you're on. So, you want to be able to have a really strong start. But part of that strong start is being able to run in the water. Now, I can't. I can't stress this enough, like in and out of the water makes a huge amount of difference in, in X-Terra racing. And it's something that nobody practices. So it's something that particularly if you're going to go to Maui, um, the waves in Maui are epic. Like some years is just massive. It's frightening. I've seen people just like break their collarbones and stuff, just trying to get out of the water because of the surf. So surf entrance and exit is a, is a massive part of that race in particular and in the swim in general for X-Terra. So um, I don't know if that's always that important for Olympic distance, but I'm going to, I'm going to highlight and put in like bold entrance and exits. Um, so then on the bike, um, like you, first off, you just need to be most of the time and it's going to help you no matter what the race is, you have to be a good climber. So you need to do a lot of work at low cadence on a hill sustained. So that just there's the meat and potatoes of all of your like sort of moderate aerobic work is just ride at really low cadence on a hill you can do that on your mountain bike you can do that on a road bike you can do that wherever you like but you need to do a whole bunch of that low cadence strength work to get ready to climb up a steep hill and then like i was saying 
if you do a bunch of that, you just need a little bit of like really fast 2040s. So low cadence and 2040s. That's meat and potatoes. Those are the only two workouts I think you really need to do for extra. Besides that like race specific practice session, which you don't need to do every week. You need to do it periodically. Um, when you do that kind of stuff, then you, then you, when you race an Xterra, you have a good idea of what your pacing is because you can feel the difference between I'm aerobic and can sustain this effort and I'm not aerobic and I'm going to die. And so basically when you're racing an Xterra, then you just have to, to use your mountain bike skills and terrain awareness. Okay. Here's where I'm going to have to do It's coming. There's like a, a little thing that I need to get an overall able to recover on the other side. So I'm going to put a massive like 20 second burst in and then I'm going to recover on the other side of it. So, um, racing in Xterra is all about like understanding your perceived effort. So again, it goes back to not looking at power numbers and just racing based on how you feel, um, and looking ahead for what's coming and sort of planning out sort of how you're going to, you're going to use your, use your gas, like where you're going to burn your matches is essentially how I like to um, describe it. Uh, and that takes a little bit of practice. That's why the hour of power is useful. That's why mountain bike racing is really useful. Um, and, and so you're just, you're just reacting to what's happening on the course. You can't really, it's not like an Olympic distance race where you're like, I'm going to ride at 250 Watts for an hour. Like that's never going to happen. This is not what the sport is. You're going to look around. You're going to be, I'm going to need to pass this guy. That's going to cost me a match. I need to get over this log. That's going to cost me a match. This hill is like five to seven minutes. I'm going to have to go like on my limits for this hill because I'm going to be at zero watts, like going down the hill. So it's planning and, and just using the fitness that you've built on the day to, to get through the course. Um, so that's, there isn't pacing. <laughs> I, I guess, I guess that, that planning, planning in advance, like yeah. looking at the course, knowing the course really well, uh, pre writing yeah. it if you can several times, but but at the very least, like really studying the course and and doing some sort of of planning as for when you're going to put in a hard effort, when you're going to be coasting downhill, that that becomes much more important. In yeah, Xterra and I think that that to, like the on road track. Every time I like like look at a program for an athlete, when you come into the final stage, like the last five weeks, ideally that stage reflects what the challenge coming is, right? So ideally you know what the race course is like which most race courses you would and so therefore you would be practicing for what's going to happen on that race course so like for Maui you need to practice for it to be really hot for it to be a really steep climb and then potentially for um well you know potentially for it to be muddy I don't know like you don't you just don't you you don't know 100% what you're going to be coming up against but you practice as, as well as you can and then what happens is if you've practiced it in training then when it comes to race day you know what you can do right you've trained specifically for what that is and nothing like you might have a really good day on race day but you're not going to suddenly become another athlete that day so you still need to listen to your own body cues and and know okay this is my pace this guy might be passing me right now but if I go with him I'm going to die right you just need to have that internal um, measurement of how hard you're going and just use that and, and basically say, okay, well, if this is all I can do right now. I'm going to have to get them later or I'll get them on the day or whatever. You need to ride with your own limits um, because ultimately it is a time trial from start to finish. So the bike matters, but the run matters too. So it, you just have to pace according to what your fitness is. And, and that pacing is uneven. And that's why I just can't stress enough how important it is to like, yeah, not use numbers it's just you need to use you need to when you're training you need to dial into what it feels like because um racing is is chaotic it's not it's it's not gonna fall within a nice like easily easily described and measured sort of output it's gonna be like a mess and what about nutrition and hydration uh, any what's your recommendations there um, so I think when I, when I switched to like full Ironman, the nutrition side became like this, like ridiculously important thing that like, you can't even express your fitness without it. Whereas I feel like extra isn't, it isn't quite as stressful in, in that regard. I think that the main thing is you want to have like drinks in your bottles 
and food in your pocket or on your bike, right? So like your drink should be not, you shouldn't be trying to get calories from your bottles. You should just be getting all hydration from your bottles or your camelback. And that's like a, that's a personal preference. If you're good with a camelback, then you should use that um, because you can carry more. It's kind of out of the way. Your bike is lighter. Um, if you don't like the camelback, then you have to be sure that you're going to be able to grab bottles at speed. Um, you're going to be able to take your hands off the bars to drink. All of those things you need to know from training in advance. So you need to practice exactly what you're going to do in the race in your training sessions. Um, and then like you, you probably, the race, depending on how long it is, like not all races are really long. Like the IT worlds in Spain, I think was less than two hours. Like, I mean, I might've had a gel probably didn't, you don't need that much when it's a really short race. I'd probably drink, you know, half a bottle. Um, that maybe that's not ideal, but like that is the reality. Like you don't, if it's less than two hours, you're, you're not really going to get into a situation where you're super bonky. Um, if it goes past two hours, and I think for Maui in particular, the biggest issue with Maui is you're going to be sweating a lot. It's super humid. Um, I think hydration is the biggest issue in that race. And, um, and because the course is, um, it's, it's unpredictable. It is hard to drink on that course. So getting enough hydration is, is a factor and, and, you need to make sure you're drinking enough. Like I probably need to drink two bottles an hour when it's that hot. And that's really hard to do at that race. So um, I think a lot of practice and, and planning for, for how you're going to get all those drinks in you is important. Yeah. And and speaking about nutrition, do you have any, what, what are your thoughts on nutrition in general in, uh, in your day to day life? Do you have any, anything special or is it just normal balanced food, eat enough uh, sort of thing that yeah. you're, you're yeah, going I with? Think that- you know, most of the advice that is complicated is bullshit. Oh, I shouldn't say that. It's just, it's crap. You know, people want to sell a program. And so what science is proving is that A, your body wants to eat real food. Like they actually did a study and I read it where they um, compared the uptake of protein from a whey protein shake to a sandwich. And so athletes did like a hard workout and then they had a shake after And then another group had a sandwich. The ones that had the shake after, so this like processed food, start start immediately started to uptake protein and um, were were making muscles. Right. The the group would, and then an hour later, that protein, the amino acid uptake or whatever, stopped completely. So they had an hour of muscle protein synthesis. The sandwich person, whose sandwich was harder to break down, and they had to go through the whole thing, they continued to make uptake of amino acids and whatnots for hours, right? So it just goes to show that your body wants real food. Vitamins are like not accessible to your body. Um, You need to eat a variety of healthy, natural foods that aren't really, that are not processed in order to have access to all these like micro minerals and whatever. So Your body knows best and it likes to and needs to eat a variety of things. So every time it's a diet where it says you can't eat this, you can't eat gluten. If you're celiac, you can't eat gluten. Your body will reject it. You will like end up in the hospital. If your body isn't rejecting gluten, you probably need to eat those kinds of foods because they have a whole bunch of B vitamins and carbohydrates are the number one thing your body needs to perform as an athlete. I think that what happens a lot, particularly with women, very often with men as well, is that there's a, there's a, um, a fascination with, um, body shape and not everybody is going to be a certain body shape and not everybody can acquire a certain shape of body in a short period of time. I know if you look at like elite marathoners that have been running for 20 years, they are just, just, you know greyhounds that are specifically like their body is just optimized to the to what they've been doing for 20 years they have like no body fat they're just you know lean machines but they're also on the razor edge of injury because there's just so little like there's no fat there's no I mean they just well I mean they're also training at like the elite level which is always a razor edge but like so for a high school runner to come out and and their body is just not that lean because like when you're younger, it's just, you just tend to not be that lean. Um, 
trying to acquire that body shape in a really short period of time, like two years versus 20, is always a recipe for disaster. When I talk to, to triathletes, you don't have to be super lean and, and look like, like somebody who you might um, be looking up to because that's probably not going to be you anyways. Right? That's probably, that person probably is nowhere near built like you. And I always feel like it's really a mistake for professional athletes to talk about um, eating less, you know, training more, you know, you need to make sacrifices and like all these things, because all of these words are, are, um, they're, they're shaming, you know, they're shaming people for eating food. And really, in order to like perform all this exercise, you have to eat <laughs> Food. because otherwise your body's not going to repair and i think that for the for the the large portion of the population your first job is to do the training if you can't do the training then forget about the body shape because you like it doesn't matter how skinny you are if you don't do the training you're still gonna be slow right and most of the time that's what it is i need to be skinnier because i'm i'm not gonna i'm not going fast enough i weigh too much when really it's like no you have to build this body of work at a relatively easy pace and stockpile a, a whole bunch of mitochondria that allow you to, to do more work because my saying is always you have to do the training to do the training to do the training. Now, every time you do something that's like impairing your body's ability to recover, which is, which is like not eating enough, you can't do the training. So then you haven't done the training. So you can't do the training and you can't do the training. So e nutrition is, is, it's it's deceptively simple eat food kind of a lot of it because you're exercising a lot and get enough rest and then eat more food and most of the time if you're eating food that is healthy and you're eating enough of it you're probably not eating all these things that your body is craving because you're not feeding it enough so if you start with just eat as much food as you need to right eat whatever your body wants you to eat and you're probably going to be okay if you feel like you have an issue, like, oh, I eat way too much. Like my portion sizes are way off. Maybe see someone about portion sizes, but still eat that same food because it's not, it's, it's not about a special diet. It's not about eliminating certain foods. It's not about restricting things. It's, it's about fueling your body. And, and that's where I think this, this multi-billion dollar nutrition industry is like messing with people's brains because you can't not, you can't perform without eating. So you can't drive your car without putting gas in it. It's just logically, it just makes no sense to like be restricting food. So I, that's, I just tell athletes just eat whatever. I don't actually care what anybody weighs. Until they're like professional athlete and they're going to go to the Olympics and we're looking for like a few seconds. At that point, that athlete might want to be like looking at what their last stage of optimization is. But most athletes that I talk to, they probably need to eat more. They're, they're restricting a lot. And they, probably, and they might actually end up being leaner because they're, they're, they're um, keeping their muscles. That, that, that's the one thing that happens all the time is that athletes are restricting. They're taking foods out. They're probably not getting enough protein because they're not eating enough and therefore their muscles are wasting and they're getting into a vicious cycle of like they're losing muscle and their metabolism's going down. So I, th I think most of the time people just need to eat more and it just needs to be more real food. Couldn't agree more. And well, this is not a real food example <laughs> necessarily, but you mentioned Brett Sutton earlier and it uh, reminded me of an article that he wrote very recently about nutrition and the weight debate. And, and he mentioned there an anecdote about uh, well, he does this apparently for all of his pro triathletes in, in some way, shape of, or form. But with Chrissy Wellington specifically, he was known to at least once or if not twice per week, he would uh, bring her like a big, big chunk of, uh, of Swiss chocolate that he had her eat so that, uh, so that she, she would get enough energy and have enough energy availability for, for training. Uh, so yeah, may, maybe if you're not training, the volumes <laughs> that Chrissy does, may, maybe not as much, quite as much chocolate and it, get some of that from other sources but but i still the, the point remains that having enough energy on board is to, so that you can do the training is uh, the absolute key to to everything well and i think all of this is linked together because you get the same the same athletes that don't like have 
don't have a, a solid grasp on what they should be eating day to day are then doing workouts that are harder because they feel like they have to burn off the food that they've eaten, you know, so that the, there isn't a, this is my day to day eating plan. And then I, now I'm fueling my, um, activity as well. And so it, the two are linked together. Like generally if you're eating healthy food and I don't think like eating a giant bar of Swiss chocolate is like, I, I think that's equally like sort of disordered, right? <laughs> Obviously a giant chocolate bar is not ideal for like rebuilding muscle. You know, I would, I probably tell people you need to eat a plate of like half carbohydrates, you know, and then a bunch, like have a bunch of vegetables on there and then have like a quarter of your plate be the protein source, right? There's, there's, if you look at what your plate should look like, that's kind of what it should always look like. If you're still hungry, eat more salad you know, and make your salads have like nuts and feta cheese and like make your salad interesting, not just a bunch of lettuce, like coated with salad dressing, make it a big yummy thing of like vegetables or whatever. Um, when you're eating like that, you, you can stop eating, right? Like you've eaten something that's satisfying. There's a bunch of variety. It tasted good. You feel like you've eaten something like you're happy, right? And, but if you're eating something that's like, you know, it's, you know, it's not enough and you know, it's not <clears throat> tasting that good. It's like, it's just not satisfying from an emotional or from a physical standpoint. That's when your body's going to be like, no, I, you need to give me more. And that's when you're going to end up being like something that doesn't make you feel good after. Like you're going to basically like mindlessly eat a bag of gummy bears or like, you know, just crap that you, doesn't make you feel good eating it, but you were craving something because you hadn't eaten properly to start with. And so I think most athletes just need to plan out their meals where they're getting, you know, <clears throat> somewhere yeah. between <clears throat> 15 and 22 grams of protein every two or three hours. So your snacks probably need to have a little bit of protein in them. So you're like keeping that muscle, you know, preservation happening. And then when you eat all these meals of like real food, you kind of don't need any junk and then you don't need a fad diet because your body just sort of is is going to be optimized based on that. And it's going to be optimized for you. Like whatever your body is, your body is not going to look like, like I'm never going to look like Shalane Flanagan ever. It's just never going to happen. I'm never going to look like Simone Biles, right? Those never going to happen. We're just not built the same. So I'm just going to look like me and this is going to be what my body is like. And, and sometimes this body goes fast and sometimes it goes slow depending on like where I'm at in the training cycle. It's, it's not my body or the shape of my body that is the issue. It's, it's getting to where I'm at my optimized place of performance and, and focusing too much attention on what my body looks like is not going to get me there any faster. So that, that's what I generally advocate for people is like, appreciate your body for what it can do. I mean, even the fact that you want to race an Xterra and you want to be faster at it, like that just means your body's doing a lot for you and you should celebrate that and be happy about that. And then just give it whatever it needs so that you can do more of the training. Because no matter what happens at the race, the, the fun part of all this is doing the training. So fuel that because this is how you're spending your life, right? You don't want to spend every day of your life miserable because you're on some stupid diet that's not making any difference to your performance. You want to spend your days eating food that makes you happy with people that you love, fueling exercise that creates activities that are memorable and fun and healthy and you know, like giving you this awesome life that you're creating. So nutrition shouldn't be something that ends up being a big bummer in your life. And most Absolutely. of the time yeah. it ends up being that way. Totally agree. That's uh, that's a really, really good perspective. And final question before the rapid fire questions, uh, just uh, briefly, can you discuss the gear that's needed for Xterra that we don't need in normal triathlons? And and do you have any recommendations for how to go about selecting gear? Um, yeah, so I get I, like the biggest thing is like choosing the right bike for the for the race, right? And and I think that that there's a there's just so much there's so many options and most of the choices are individual. So really it just comes with some experience and, and testing different gear to decide what works for you. So like whether you ride a hardtail or a dual suspension, I think a lot of times that sort of is determined by the terrain that you're riding at home. 
So here in, in Victoria, Vancouver Island, Vancouver, nobody owns a hardtail. Like you just can't, you just, it, it just sucks to ride here on that because the train's really technical and rocky and steep and uneven and gnarly, right? So you basically want to have a dual suspension for this kind of riding because it's just way more fun to start with. And it's just way more practical for this type of train. Now, that being said, like there's no x that are anywhere near like what we ride here, really. Like there's some that are close, but not really. So do, would I need a, a dual suspension bike um, to ride other courses? Like potentially not. And when I was racing x full time, I definitely mostly took a hardtail to all the other races. So, but, but my skill level was quite high at the time. I think that if you're a beginner rider, a dual suspension bike will be very forgiving on your while you're learning skills. So I think that most mm-hmm. beginners should ride a dual suspension. And there is a lot to be said for having a dual suspension for saving some energy for the run. So that that's what I'd say the hardtail versus um, dual suspension debate. Um, but there, that's like, we could talk about this for like an hour and a half. So we won't get too much of that. You need a mountain bike. Let's start with that. It's illegal to ride a cross bike in Xterra. Start with a mountain bike, start riding one, start learning about mountain biking, and you'll start to figure out which mountain bike is right for you. Um, I think another big thing to like think about is like, do you want to have trail shoes or do you want to have just a, a regular shoe or a race flat or whatever? Again, some courses I find were, I, re, I always raced in race flats, like basically something like the type A sockety shoe I ran in a lot. Um, I had like versions of lightweight trainers that were pretty close to, to that. Um, and there were some courses that like the Ogden course has all these embedded rocks and I would just hurt my feet every time because you just land on uneven hard rocks all the time. It was actually really hard on my feet. So I think that, that people would talk about wearing hokas on those courses because of, of those kind of rocky courses. So a little bit of tread to like cushion your feet is nice in some of those races. Um, I find hokas impossible to run in. Like they're just not pretty. Um, I think depending on what you have trained in. So I also saw in Maui last year, um, athletes taking race flats and pounding screws into them to create like a cross country spike. Um, so I think cross country spikes work at muddy races if you run in them. Um, or like something that's like an entry level cross country spike where you, you have a little bit of like extra tread on, and they're not removable spikes. So not quite as hard, um, the bottom, because I think cross country spikes, you'd have to train a lot to like not blow out your Achilles. Um, you need to get used to running in shoes that flat. So the only reason I'm mentioning that is that we're probably coming up to Maui. Some athletes are going to go to Maui. Maui was a disaster last year. It was so muddy. It was like impossible to get any sort of traction. And so everybody was doing whatever they could to try and be able to stay on their feet. And, and those cross country spikes were an option for that. So, um, that, that might be worth it. Uh, I really like the new, I, I ran in the Nike, um, Pegasus trail shoe in Victoria. Um, I really like the shoe. Um, one thing I would say that I forgot about Xterra cause I haven't been racing as much and the Victoria Xterra run course is ridiculously technical. It's like the run is way more technical than the bike. And, and that's not really my forte since I broke my ankle. But, um, one thing I noticed is that running in that trail shoe and then running in that trail shoe with like elastic laces, um, the laces don't hold your foot as well. And so that the type of elastic lace that you use, if you are going to opt for those, when the course is really technical, um, can be eye opening. So certainly you want to have the stiffest type of laces that you can, because when your feet move around in those shoes and in really technical terrain, um, it's dangerous. So, so elastic laces can be, um, a liability in Xterra and there's something that you need to make sure are going to work out for you. Um, it could be that it's better to have like a stiff lace and then just a toggle, um, to make sure that your shoe, your feet stay put. So those are two things like of common gear that I think, um, matter a lot. And then we got a little bit into the camelback versus a water bottle sort of debate in terms of hydration on the bike. I don't think you ever use a camelback in an Olympic distance triathlon, but certainly an Xterra would be an option. Um, and the camelback also kind of gives you a chance to carry some, um, flat repair type stuff that gives you a place to put some things. So, um, I think those are the three main things. Oh, and, and, and then I think without exception, you want to wear gloves 
on the mountain bike when you're racing in Xterra. It's it's really dangerous. Your hands are really sweaty. Um, you, you need to be able to like maneuver your bars, and and I think from a safety perspective, it's ridiculous to not wear um, gloves in Xterra. I've done it a couple times and nearly crashed so hard, like my hands flying off. So I definitely think um, those were failed experiments. You need to wear gloves <laughs> for sure. Um, oh, and I guess the last thing might be the shoes. Um, you, there's no, right. one of the reasons why putting your shoes on your bike in a road triathlon is that like clomping along in your, in your cleats along the pavement is really slow. Like you can't run as fast. And so that's why putting shoes on your bike and then running with your bike is significantly faster. Um, what I found is I, like, I actually have custom shoes where it's like a road upper on mountain bike sole. And, and I'm going to work with some companies to create more of these shoes, um, with limited success. I'm still working on it. Um, but if you don't have that, most mountain bike shoes now have some sort of ratchet. And even the BOA system is more like a ratchet. And it makes it really difficult to put the shoe on while you're on your bike. There there are some rear entry shoes that are available that, you know, aren't as, aren't as rel- readily available for um, mountain bike soles. So for a while there, we were taking road shoes and trying to like screw a, a mountain bike cleat on. And I wouldn't recommend that. So mostly what I, from, from what, what I've, experienced and what I've tested with other athletes, you can quickly put your shoes on in transition um, and run out in them. And you can run just as fast in your mountain bike shoe as you can your feet. So the the time is spent putting the shoe on. And I think you're better off to put your shoes on standing there than to try and fiddle around with your shoe on your bike while you're moving. Because most of the time you're moving and it's uneven terrain and it's like it's not a road, right? It's not, you're, you're, you're going to have a hard time getting that shoe on. So the, the idea of having like a shoes on the bike sort of transition should just kind of be like forgotten. You can do it when you're coming off your bike, but generally like I wouldn't worry that much about that kind of transition. And so then it doesn't really matter what the shoes you are, you're wearing, just make sure you can get them on and get them off. Good advice. So let's move into the rapid fire questions. And these are one sentence types of answers and one sentence questions. And the first one is what's your favorite book, blog, or resource related to triathlon? Hmm. Uh, well, recently I've been reading um, that book Roar, like kind of comparing women's physiology to men's physiology by um, Stacey Stim- Sims and that's that's kind of been really interesting for me to read what her thoughts are on the difference between women and men. Um, and then my other, like the, my, the other resource I've been, it's it's related to triathlon, but more sort of like my my latest sort of obsession. Um, I've been reading pretty much everything that Canova has written about marathon running, and and it's sort of been really interesting from a periodization perspective and and affecting sort of how I approach triathlon and, and in general, whether it's Ironman, half Ironman, Olympic distance or, or x in terms of like um, narrowing the focus of specificity as you get closer and closer to the event. So I think, I think Canova has really been eye opening for me and, um, and Stacy, you know, and sort of like understanding my fellow women. <laughs> Stacy Sims is a past guest of the podcast episode 105 or something. I'll link to it in oh, the show good. notes. And uh, <laughs> the week before your episode goes out, I actually have uh, Matt Fox, fr- who runs Sweat Elite, the website that you may be aware of. Yeah. And uh, and uh, he we discussed a lot of Renato Canova's uh, training oh, methodology in that episode. So <laughs> that's a funny coincidence. Yeah. Uh, so next uh, is, so what's your favorite piece of gear or equipment? Stairs. I think uh, stairs are probably the number one run mechanics um, equipment you could use so i like everyone to have access to a nice set of stairs good you're the first one to answer that that's uh, that's always fun and finally what do you wish you had known or done differently at some point in your career um i think i never learned it took me until i i actually hurt myself and broke my ankle to really learn about how to run um i never had any like any meaningful run training like from yeah i mean i never learned how to run and and so once i couldn't run i really had to understand how to run and and that sort of has <clears throat> changed sort of my whole philosophy on building up runners who have never known how to run and um i think that i would have had 
um, a lot less um, injury. I would have been a faster runner had I um, understood the mechanics of running and how to train for it better um, before. So I think that I, I think that's, I think maybe you benefited us. Yeah, maybe you benefited as a coach from from learning it the hard way. Yeah, and and I think that's that's the one thing I would leave people with is like, like especially with the Ironman um, athletes that are willing to spend like five hundred bucks to get a bike fit, and they'll they'll take lessons for swimming, and they and they'll never go to anyone to like have any sort of feedback on how they're running, and and understand that yeah, I need a coach to learn how to because you can't change your running by going to a weekend course, right? Like even if you suddenly became a hundred percent efficient, your body isn't strong in, in, in making those and in, in moving like that. And so it, it takes a long time. And I, I think that most athletes need the most coaching on, on how to apply force to the ground. Um, and you need a coach one-on-one, you need to do camps to like figure out how to do that. And that's what I wish I had had access to number one. And um, I wish I just had that knowledge before. So to round this up, uh, tell people where they can find find you online and on social media and if they want to learn more about you and uh, your coaching and everything else you've got going on. Uh, sure, yeah. So my, uh, my coaching website is melrad.com, M-E-L-R-A-D. Um, and my, uh, my squad is called Melrad Racing. Um, pretty much all of our social media is Melrad Coaching. So Facebook, Melrad Coaching, Instagram, Melrad Coaching, and Twitter, Melrad Coaching. Perfect. So anybody, yeah, wants to find us there. Yeah, and we'll have it all linked in the show notes as usual. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Melanie. It was uh, really great. We've been going for a long time, but uh, I've never yeah. done an episode on next era. So it's probably good <laughs> that the first one was the real masterclass and a deep dive into it. So uh, now, I, now I have something to point people to when, when I get questions about next era training. <laughs> Thank you. Well, yeah, it's been a pleasure. And uh, I just think the sport itself is fantastic and unique. And uh, it's, it's, it's just definitely my mission to, uh, to create a, a, a whole army of Xterra specific athletes to uh, continue the sport. That sounds excellent. Okay, so talk to you later, Melanie. Bye. Okay, thank you. I hope that you enjoyed that discussion as much as I did. I think that Melanie had tons of really, really great points there and a lot of interesting perspectives that we can all learn from. So definitely one of the greatest interviews that uh, that I've done in a a long time and one of the conversations that I really, really enjoyed being in. You can find the show notes because this was a long episode, so I understand that you uh, probably can't quite remember everything that we discussed. So go and review what uh, what we covered on that thattraflonshow.com and uh, click through to episode 196, and that's where you'll find the show notes. In episode 197, next Monday, I interview Evan Schwartz from Stride, and we will discuss uh, mostly the impact that wind has on running. So how much more power do you have to produce when running into a head, headwind, for example, and uh, compared to running with a tailwind or, or running in still conditions. So those are some really interesting uh, interesting numbers and examples that we, we talk through as well, uh, whether you use a stride uh, power meter or not. So definitely uh, make sure that you don't miss that. And actually to do that, uh, if you aren't subscribed to the podcast, then that's worth doing because there is a new episode every single Monday and Thursday, a Q&A on Thursday and uh, uh, an interview or other long form in, long form episode on Monday. So stay subscribed so that you don't miss anything. Finally, thank you to our sponsors uh, Roka that you can find on roka.com. Get 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS all caps. And thank you to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. And remember that end of August deadline for using the promo code that triathlon show 20 to get 20% off your order on precisionhydration.com. That's coming up soon, so uh, don't wait. But of course, there's the other code as well, that triathlon show, all on word, all caps, if you just want to try a single box or tube of electrolyte product. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlon. <laughs>